everyone. I'm sorry for a little late uh, start with the House Energy and Technology Committee meeting uh, Friday morning. Um, this morning, we are taking up the Global Warming Solutions Act, which is H-688. Um, it's a bill that we um, had in this committee in January and February um, with the House passage back in February. Um, the Senate has worked on this bill in May and June this year and has sent it back to us with some amendments, um, which we're going to be discussing uh, this morning. Um, we have our legislative counsel on the bill, Luke Martland, with us this morning. Um, thanks for joining us, Luke. Um, and just a little situational awareness to the extent that I have it and can share uh, with the committee. Um, my understanding from the speaker is that she is anticipating um, pulling this bill off the calendar uh, next week for action. Um, I, I don't have any precise visibility on timing other than um, there's interest in moving this bill somewhat in concurrence, or not in concurrence, but um, along a parallel path with the budget. So depending on when the budget gets to the floor, my anticipation is that the speaker will um, be looking to pull this bill off the calendar at about the same time. Um, and so certainly want to take the time this morning to go through the Senate proposals of amendment, um, uh, discuss those, and um, as the reporter of the bill, when that bill comes to the uh, comes back to the floor, I'll need to report um, what our committee's uh, support was for those amendments or not. Um, so hence the discussion this morning to get updated on those amendments, um, uh, get the committee's view on those amendments, and um, from my perspective, to prepare for what would be a, uh, a floor report on that. Um, Luke, I know that you have some documents that are posted to our website, um, three of them, I think, and that you wanted to use maybe one or two of them this morning for us to, um, to, to go, walk, you know, go through the walkthrough with you. Is there, is there one that we should pull up or do you want to pull them up on the screen? There is a one that I'll use and I'll pull it up and show it to you on my screen. I think that might be easiest and then you can all okay. just follow along. Good morning, everybody. Luke Marlin from Legislative Council. Did you have anything else to say, Mr. Chair? Before no, that was, I just wanted to kind of introduce um, what we'll do this morning. And, you know, to the extent that I have visibility on next week, I wanted the um, committee to be aware of that as well. Yes. Well, thank you. And once again, good morning, everybody. So today we're talking about H-688, the Vermont Global Warming Solution Act. And as the chair indicated, this was a bill you last looked at in February. Then it went to the Senate and the Senate returned proposals of amendment. There's uh, six proposals of amendment, at least two of them are not substantive. And I emailed you two documents yesterday. One is the normal side-by-side -side that you're probably used to seeing anytime you're comparing a House and Senate bill. And please feel free to look at that. If we were in the State House, I'd probably bring you paper copies of that side-by-side -side document because it's a big document and that's what would use to go through the changes. However, it's awfully tough to see that on a small screen. And so what I did in the document I'll use today is a little different. I took the House as passed version of the bill and I incorporated the Senate proposals of amendment and highlighted them. And I thought that might be a little quicker and a little easier for you to see the context of those Senate proposals of amendment. And so I'll pull up that document now and show it to you and we'll use that as I do my walk through. As always, I hope you all can hear me clearly. If not, please, raise your hand or let me know. And if there's any questions, of course, please interrupt. So let's begin by looking at this document. L Luke, I'm yes. sorry to interrupt. R Robin, did I see your hand go up? I beg your pardon. Yes, um, and I'm, I'm asking it now because I'm afraid I'll lose the hand function once Luke's screen takes over. Okay. Um, and it's just to clarify that the, the uh, the lines that are struck out and changed, but not highlighted in yellow, are are those changes that we made back in yeah. June? Yes. So good okay. question. Um, everything that the Senate is proposing, I've highlighted in yellow. So Got it's it. not highlighted. It's exactly the text that you had 
in the bill that you pass out of the house in February. Okay, thank you. Okay. And, and Danielle, can you make me a co-host just so I can see hands when they go up? Thank you. All righty, Luke. Great, and once I share the screen, I won't be able to see your videos. Uh, so say something, interrupt me if yeah, you have a question. I will look please. for hands as they come up. <laughs> Great, so uh, as an introduction, there's no amendments or proposed amendments to section one, which is a short title, section two, which is the findings, or section three, which is the greenhouse gas reduction requirements. Instead, the first proposal of amendment is now in section four, and this is the language would be the new chapter in title 10 that concerns the Vermont Climate Council, the Climate Action Plan, and the rulemaking authority. So in section 590, which is definitions, there was a typographical error that I had made that the Senate corrected. In other words, in your version, I had a five, it should have been four, it's a numbering change. The next proposal of- And Luke, did you wanna bring this up on the screen? Yeah, isn't it, it's you can't a, see it? Oh, I'm sorry, no, hold on a second. Let me, let me fix yep. that. So my mistake, I thought I'd share it, thank you. Can everyone see this now? I can. It's on my yep. screen. Though. You can see it. Yep. Can everyone else see it? Yes. Yep. Excellent. Yep. Thank, thank you for uh, telling me that. I didn't realize it. I can so see, one, I can awesome. see the resolution is uh, poor, so if you can magnify it a bit. Um, let me try to do that. I'm also I'm thinking about is that rate. a little better? There you go. Yeah, yeah, that's better. Okay. So thank you. Once again, we're now in section four of the bill. The new chapter added to Title 10 definitions, they corrected a numbering mistake. Going on to the next page uh, where there is a uh, correction is on page seven. And let me back up a little bit. This is now the composition of the council. The people who will be on the council, and if you remember, there's executive branch representatives, and there's also folks appointed by the House and by the Senate. What the Senate did is add another member to be appointed by the speaker. In H, this is new language, one member to represent Vermont manufacturers. There will now be 23 total members of the council, eight in the executive branch, seven appointed by the Senate, and eight now appointed by the House. The next change is on page 13. And I'll go to the preceding page. We're still in the same section of law 591, which concerns the council. And the amendment is to sub section F, which has language about the quorum and how the council will meet. You'll see at the bottom of this page, the highlighted language was added and I'll try to get the whole, there it is, shall meet at the call of the chair or a majority of the members of the council and the council, and then it proceeds with the language you had in. This was added to allow a majority of the members of the council to call a meeting. If for example, the chair of the council, who is the secretary of administration, fails to call meetings. So it's sort of a safety valve that the chair is not calling meetings, a majority of the council can call a meeting. Are there any questions about that? I will then jump to the next change, which is on page 21. Now I see there might be a question. Yes, um, on the previous change that you talked about, um, did it? Did we not have a stipulation as to when the meetings may be called? Well, you had a requirement that the meeting be called. I forget the timeline fairly quickly, so you had a time frame, but you didn't have any language. You said that the uh, chair would call the meetings, but you didn't have any safety valve if the chair isn't calling 
meetings or polling meetings as often as the rest of the council would like. Okay, so. Do you want me to go back to the language? Well, uh, where, did, where did we stipulate that the chair should call the meetings? Uh, I'd have to look that up. I'm not certain of the exact. But, but not it might not very well be in the same area. Let me look. I think there is language that the chair at least calls the first to, calls the meetings. I forget where that is. I'm sorry. Okay, but we we had it in there somewhere. I, I I can double check that when I'm done and you guys are having your discussion. I'll go back and double check. But I'm pretty sure you did. All right. Thank you. So going back to page twenty one of this document. So this is now in the section of the bill concerning the rulemaking by a &R. It would be in the new uh, 10 VSA 593. And we see in K, it's just a, a word change from promulgate rules to adopt rules. This is not a substantive change that has any legal significance. It was, uh, we like to use in Ledge Council the phrase adopt rules and we try to be consistent. So when I was going back through it, I caught that uh, I'd use promulgate, I should have used the word adopt. So it's simply making that change. It does not have any legal impact. Going on to the next um, proposed amendment, which is on page 24 of this document. So this is now in the language pertaining to the cause of action. And if you remember here in C, there's language that a prevailing party can under certain circumstances recoup uh, costs or attorney's fees. And the language that is changed is in two, which pertains to the defendant. In other words, the state of Vermont, a &R, the attorney general's office would be uh, carrying out the litigation, but they would be defending a &R. In a lawsuit that a &R wins, uh, they can be under certain circumstances awarded reasonable costs, that's the language you had, the Senate added in the words an attorney's fees if the action was deemed frivolous by the court. So it allows the state of Vermont to recoup attorney's fees if the cause of action was deemed frivolous. Are there any questions Luke, about Luke, that? Luke, I've got a, a uh, it's Tim. I've got a quick question on that. And sure. this is um, more my uh, lack of understanding of how um, kind of the plaintiff's attorney's world might work, which is I had thought that we had covered um, the state of Vermont being awarded reasonable costs, that that was a pretty wide ranging thing. Um, I certainly understand and agree with adding attorney's fees, but is that somehow a um, kind of special expense or special cost that needs to be called out. That, that's the only thing I wasn't familiar with. Well, if you see in one above, which is the plaintiff, they could both uh, get costs and attorney's fees. I yes. think the reason why you didn't include attorney's fees is the attorneys who would be defending the state are assistant attorney generals. Their yep. salary is already paid. So it, I think you discuss, well, should we, since they're already being paid and they're going to be paid regardless and they're working for the state, should we also be able to recoup, um, you know, compensation for their salary or not? Yeah, uh, this was in Senate Judiciary. One senator thought it was important to add this in, and um, they added yep. it in. The AG's office did testify. I don't think they had a strong opinion one way or the other. Okay, I understand, and, and I, I also see the uh, parallel to the um, the prior subsection. So, gotcha. understood. Um, I see Robin's hand up. Go ahead, Robin. Thank you. Um, Luke, I'm just a building on, on Tim's question. What is the difference? What is included in costs as opposed to attorney's fees? Well, well costs could be a range of things. It could be, um, say, your plaintiff, the filing fee when you file the cause of action to get into court. It could be um, costs associated with experts. Remember, we talked okay. that some of these uh, lawsuits might be 
uh, cut and dried. Uh, the, mm -hmm. uh, the cause of action of A&R had done nothing, for example, um, what we call the writ of mandamus, but other ones might be quite complex. You might have expert testimony. You might need experts to come to court. You might need to pay for them to uh, mm -hmm. do their analysis. You know, there might be a whole range of costs to bring the action or defend the action. I think those are the type of costs that maybe could be recouped. Thank you. Uh, Avram, did you have a question? Uh, yes, just following up. Luke, are, are you aware whether the Attorney uh, General's office uh, in cases, whether it's on this subject or, or any other, sometimes hires outside counsel to assist in a case? Uh, I'm not sure about that. And these the analogy would be causes of action under the Administrative Procedure Act. I don't know if they hire outside counsel. I think in... Uh, potentially in this cause of action, they might be hiring experts or people to do statistical analysis or, or data crunching. Um, I don't know if they would, but that's what I thought maybe would be some outside expert or, you know, uh, company to do some kind of analysis that might be relevant. Um, don't see any other hands up, Luke. So. Great. So now we're gonna to jump to the end of the bill. And this is now uh, going to the section on appropriation, the money section, and then section, what was section 10 about new positions to help carry uh, forth the act. These were both stricken. So money was taken out and the new positions were taken out by the Senate. And as a result, the number for the effective date the number of that section would also change. So that is the final proposals of amendment for the Senate. And that concludes my walkthrough. Are there any questions? Should I keep the document up or should I take it down? What's best? Well, why don't we keep it up unless um, members would prefer to um... Uh, to look at, yeah, why don't we keep it up, Luke? I think it's easier, especially since this is what you've made us familiar with uh, in the walkthrough. Um, and I'm just flipping through the document on my home computer screen right now to see if there are any other um, things that I wanted to bring up. Um, Mike Yantachka had that question earlier, um, which I've been flipping through, Mike, I don't know if you have as well about my recollection about that question. Um, and this is at the um, bottom of page 13, top of page 14 about um, how the committee could meet or how the committee could be called into um, to meeting. Um, and I do remember discussing this as uh, a committee topic back in February. And similar to Mike, I. I thought I had a recollection that there was something in here that would constitute um, calling a meeting and I'm not seeing it right now, but I, I also do remember having this question of um, what if, you know, for whatever reason, the chair in their unilateral power decided they didn't want to call meetings of the council. They didn't want the council to meet. Um, what was, you know, the ability of the council to still meet and, uh, I had listened to the Senate testimony on this and clearly this is meant to address that issue. Um, but Representative Yantachka, I'm not finding in here other ways that the um, council could be called into meeting. Mike, I don't know if you found it or Luke. And yeah, I'm trying to, I was trying to read through oh, the uh, bill and I didn't see anything either. So I think I was mistaken. I don't think there's language saying the chair shall call meetings. I don't see it at least. I'll keep looking, but I think- Well, right. th you know, that said that I'm glad this language is in because I, I thought there was something in there about meetings being called. And um, this was a question that had come up before. Um, clearly we hadn't resolved it. So, okay. Um, again, I'm just flipping through. Okay. Um, I'm not seeing any hands up, um, but I would certainly welcome 
you know, any questions or commentary that people have on this. Um, you know, one of the advantages of uh, Zoom hearings is uh, the fact that you get to listen to what other committees are working on. Um, and I had taken the opportunity to listen to some of the Senate testimony, um, some of the witnesses, similar to witnesses that we had in our committee, um, but some of the discussion about some of these changes. Um, I do see a couple of hands up. Uh, first, uh, Mike, and then uh, Laura, questions or comments? Yeah, I see in section six that it says that uh, the chair the chair shall call the first meeting of the council within 30 days after all members have been appointed, but it doesn't, yep. there's no other call specified other than the uh, change that the Senate made. Yep. Okay. Thanks for that, Mike. That was also going to be my comment, Mr. Chair. So. Well, Mike beat you to it. Mike gets an he apple. He beat me to it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so again, this is our time for committee discussion. I mean, my, my view on these changes um, are, uh, I appreciate the Senate adding the, um, you know, a member representing the manufacturing community. Um, I think it's an important sector to have represented here. It was something that we actually had considered back in January and February. And my recollection is that, um, you know, frankly, we were reluctant to put more members on the um, more members on the council. But that said, um, you know, I would certainly welcome them being an important stakeholder involved in the uh, production of this plan. <clears throat> in terms of the change on um, uh, calling meetings, I think that the change that the Senate made is not only constructive, frankly, I'm wishing it's something that we had put in there. So I appreciate that addition. Um, I've already made my comment known on the attorney's fee or the question I had there. With regard to the appropriation being taken out, um, while I was disappointed in that, I was not at all surprised. I think uh, the way that this was articulated to me by um, some senators that I spoke with was that this was not necessarily a... Um, uh, kind of an impugning of the bill in terms of taking the appropriation out, but they wanted to have this appropriation considered um, through their normal appropriation process, which um, I believe it now will be. I, I understand from the House Appropriations Committee that this is something that um, is being looked at by them and will be, uh, I'm hopeful, uh, will be included in our budget this year. We'll certainly know that maybe by the end of today, maybe it'll be by Tuesday. Um, so this got a little bit sidetracked in that this bill would be going down the path of um, uh, having these positions supported in the budget. And again, I'm hopeful and expecting that that's going to happen uh, in the House budget. So I'm, you know, I'm supportive of these uh, proposals of amendment for the uh, for this bill. Um, I don't think they change them radically. Uh, I think they are improvements on the margin. And my expectation is that um, this appropriation will be included in the House budget, or at least I'm hopeful. Uh, I see three hands up, um, Avram, Mike, and Heidi. Um, so go ahead, Avram, and then Mike and Heidi. Uh, thank you. Um, my comments really, uh, I guess, kind of echo uh, yours, Tim. Um, I, I mean, we were aware of the uh, and the um, uh, the issue around the appropriations, and, and we have the, we have uh, discussed that. So, what you know, whether whether I would have preferred leaving it in or not, that's that's uh, that's uh, a, a moot point uh, at, at, at this point. In terms of the other changes, the way I see them, they are either a few. Um, I'm just going to say technical or correction type things and a few that make um, uh, minor improvements or clarifications uh, to what we sent over. Uh, and and uh, it's probably uh, un unusual uh, uh, to get back a bill with so few changes other than the appropriation part. Uh, Mike, and then Heidi, and then Laura. 
Yeah, I just wanted to note that it was gracious of the uh, Senate to add the extra member to those appointed by the speaker. <laughs> Very empowering. Um, uh, Heidi? Um, I'll, I'll just um, echo what you said, Mr. Chairman, about the uh, additional member from the manufacturing sector. I think I was, if I recall correctly, and, and it, it, I could be wrong, but I was pushing for for that in the uh, in our in our uh, deliberations, I thought it was critical given um, given the impact, the potential impact, the probable impact this will have, all of these uh, new regulations uh, will have on our manufacturing industry. So I think it's it's critical. So I'm I'm pleased to see that 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 addition in there. Good, thank you, uh, Laura. Yeah, I would. Um, I am happy to see so few changes. <laughs> um, I feel like the Senate has made excellent suggestions, and um, I think we still have a really good bill. So I'm ready to concur. Okay. Um, Scott, did you have a comment or question? No, oh, just a comment um, that uh, echoes everyone else's comments. I think the changes are good, um, and I would, would like to support the bill as amended. Yeah. Uh, Mark, I saw your hand come up. Yeah, so uh, again, this is a comment. Um, I initially didn't vote for the bill. Um, I, I don't believe that uh, any of these changes makes it any better or any worse. Um, I think uh, there's really no good time for this, and especially now um, with another additional million dollars. Uh, I think it is a little bit uh, deceiving to pull it out of this bill and put it into the big bill, uh, which is going to be harder to, to find in a sense for a lot of folks. Um, I think I've found another $972,000 for the uh, Vermont State Colleges. Um, I would also comment, I'm sure you've all seen the letter from the governor stating that uh, there'll probably be a veto on this bill if the citizen's right to supervision doesn't come out. So again, I guess I'd like the committee to comment on that. Um, and again, uh, I will not be supporting any of these changes and, and not be supporting the bill uh, in general. Thank you. Yeah, no, thanks, Mark. Um, something that I don't, just something I wanna, uh, comment on in terms of your comments that I don't have full clarity on um, with regard to the appropriation. Uh, the appropriation that we had in our bill back in February that was adopted by the House was for $972,000. And I'm going to confess that I didn't, I didn't then and I still don't know, uh, still don't now have full clarity on um, the why the 972 number was in there at the recommendation of the Joint Fiscal Office. That's a two-year appropriation. Um, the appropriation for fiscal year uh, 21, at least as we passed it back in February, is for $586,000. The year two appropriation would be $386,000. And the only reason I bring that up, uh, Mark, is just by way of clarity, um, it's not, clear to me what the appropriation will be in the FY21 budget that the House ultimately comes out with. Um, you'd mentioned the 972 number. It could be that, I'm not saying it won't be, um, but it could also be the 586 number just to, um, you know, for a point of clarity. Um, the, uh, yeah, I think, I mean, you're right. I, I fully understand you didn't support this bill back in February and I think I have clarity on that. Um, and not surprised with regard to your, um, you know, reaction to, to these changes as well. Um, you mentioned um, a letter from the governor. I'm not sure if we're talking about the same thing or not. Um, the governor had sent me a letter back in, uh, it was probably mid-August. I can't remember exactly what the date was. Um, and it was a letter that was addressed to uh, the, I believe it was addressed to the chair of uh, House Natural Resources, the president pro tem and um, the speaker. And he raised three points. 
um, that he had questions and concerns about in the bill. Um, and they were the, the same points that um, his administration had brought up with our committee back in February. Um, so they were not surprises. One of them, um, as you noted, was the cause of action um, section in the bill, the, the, um, the ability to sue. And um, he, uh, yeah, so, so um, I, what I did not take from that letter, however, was that he was going to veto the bill over that provision. Those were three things that he raised as, you know, questions um, and concerns. Um, and uh, similarly, the Senate took testimony from the Agency of Natural Resources in May, again, with those same concerns that his administration um, had brought up. And he reiterated, he reiterated those concerns in his letter um, in August. Um, so, uh, you know, again, I, I don't have any reaction uh, to that dissimilar to, um, you know, I think my reaction to those back in February. Um, I, I did respond to his letter um, and, uh, you know, thanked him for bringing those questions to my attention again. Um, and also thanked him for his administration's work on the bill. There were a number of things that the Agency of Natural Resources brought up that we uh, did incorporate here. Um, and, you know, that was the, that was the extent of our, of our back and forth. So, um, Laura, did you have a comment or question? Well, I did. Um, now, um, you know, I think Mark has brought up um, a really valid point, and it's one that has been raised to me as well around um, around the appropriation, and particularly in a time of COVID. And so, I wanted to speak to why I absolutely believe this is appropriate. Um, the reason for me uh, feeling so strongly about this bill, you know, sponsoring this bill, uh, moving forward with this bill as I have seen, we have seen, many in our committee have seen, many of our colleagues have seen the effects of a failure to plan for, um, for the future and for transformation, um, transformational technology in the rural areas. Um, I think, you know, just remind the committee, I, I, I won't get too far into it, um, that that was my position, uh, that uh, our rural areas are incredibly vulnerable to climate change, um, the capacity to uh, participate uh, uh, in the in, uh, energy transformation that is necessary um, to keep pace with um, the more uh, densely populated areas, other states, other countries, which are changing our economy. Um, there, you know, without this activity, we are dooming our rural areas where I live, where my people live. And um, because of the work that we did, I don't even remember how many witnesses we had. It had to be close to a hundred um, that we, um, had in our committee prior to COVID um, because of the diligence that was done on this work and because of the urgency. And um, I, I absolutely believe we, these dollars are critical for protecting Vermonters and ensuring that our economy does not further deteriorate, particularly in our rural areas. So um, I think <clears throat> I just wanted to speak to that um, clearly. Thank you, Laura. Um, two more hands up, uh, Heidi and then Mike. Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to um, reiterate uh, as well. I mean, uh, I, I should have done this earlier in my first comments, but the, the addition of the of the representative from the manufacturing sector um, is important. I think much of this bill, I think, is um, is very good. My um, my objection to it as as the committee knows is um is that we we give so much power we essentially uh, cede our our authority and and responsibility to the executive branch and um and in that sense i don't i mean i just don't think it's appropriate um to give this much power to make policy um to the secretary 
um, and the executive branch. Uh, those policy decisions should be by us, by those who are elected um, by the people. Um, so I, I appreciate um, the, the addition of the person on the manufacturing center sector. I think a, a climate change plan uh, um, is, is, is important, but decisions on how that should be implemented um, should not be promulgated or adopted by rule. Um, it needs to be, um, the actual policies need to be um, voted upon by those who are elected in those in our seats. Um, this is sort of the, the, I think I said this before, the legislative equivalent of the, of the easy button from Staples um, because we don't have to be on the hook for uh, uh, voting on these policies. So I'm still very concerned about that section, I'm, uh, uh, about that, how this um, uh, is developed, the rest of the bill. I think is important, including all of the things that Laura, um, that the representative from Dover just spoke about. I, I really like the resiliency um, efforts that are in there to ensure our communities can uh, can adapt to these changing weather patterns um, and, and what have you. So, um, but I think policy decisions need to be made by those of us who are elected, and that is my uh, sole um, concern with this with this plan. And I wish um, with this bill, and I wish the. Uh, the Senate had, had taken that on. Um, I had hoped to be able to support um, a Global Warming Solutions Act uh, this year. I think I made that clear. Um, and this was my, um, my sole objection to it. And, um, and so I just, I just wanna make sure that, that, is, um, that that's clear still with uh, members of the committee and, and others. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, thank you, Heidi. Um, I see Mike's hand up and then Mark. So um, we're, we are in the middle of a pandemic uh, and that has taken priority since we passed this bill out of our committee uh, last, uh, in February. Um, but we also got to realize that we're also in the middle of, that, that's one crisis, but, but we're also in the middle of another crisis and that's a climate change crisis. And the fact that the pandemic has refocused our attention doesn't mean that we can't we can uh, stop um, attending to the climate crisis as well. Uh, this bill, we in order to effectively respond in a way that's going to help us contribute our share to reducing fossil fuel consumption and greenhouse gas emissions, we need a plan, and this bill is a foundation for for uh, providing that plan for the state of Vermont. And uh, I think it's an important piece of legislation and, and it, that it should pass. I'm done. Uh, I see uh, Mark, Mark Han. Go ahead, Yeah, uh, Tim, so, so the letter from the governor that I'm referring to is dated August 12th, 2020. Okay. Um, is, so that's, much later than the one you were referring to. Um, no, I, I guess- think I, I, So I'll just say, I, I got a letter from the governor on August 12th. So it's probably, I don't okay. know if it's the same letter or not, but that, you, that you're okay. talking about. Yeah, it's to you and, and the speaker and uh, Chairman Bray um, and, and uh, Pro Tem Ash, yeah? Yep. Um, so uh, I guess uh, going back to, um, the money that the appropriations committee is going to be looking at and not knowing, you know, how much they're going to put in for this year or, uh, you know, wh whatever that process is going to be. I think uh, that brings um, an issue to mind of a comment of Peter Walk during the Senate hearings that mm -hmm. basically said that uh, um, if there was no money, and, and I'm sure he would be concerned about the amount of money that is even being appropriated that uh, he would not be able to do the job needed uh, uh, if there wasn't funds. And I don't know if anybody's ever asked him, um, you know, actually uh, how much he would need to do an appropriate job. But I do remember his comments stating that they weren't gonna, you aren't gonna get the results you're looking for with the amount of money that's uh, being appropriated. That's my take anyway. Yeah, and I, I, I think you're, uh, actually, I don't want to put words in your mouth, mouth, Mark. So don't let me. But but I I think a, a bigger point, and maybe one that you want to uh, uh, sign on to as well, is 
if there is not money to support this bill in the budget, um, this work doesn't happen. And so um, I, I don't want to give you an avenue to defeat the bill, Mark, but um, <laughs> if, if this gets taken out of the budget, um, I think there's a big problem with, uh, with this bill going forward. Well, and again, that's my point, Tim. I mean, if this, I mean, you, you had mentioned it early on that they, the, the speaker wants this bill to go in concert with the, the uh, appropriations bill, the big bill. Um, yep. what, yeah, what if, what if one of the other fails? I mean, um, yeah, that's, that's anyway, uh, that, that's yeah, fine. No, me, I, I guess. I, <laughs> so I, 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 I'm sorry. I'm sorry I brought it up. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think, um, I mean, in, in all uh, candor uh, and transparency, I, that's what the speaker has said to me as to, um, you know, why we didn't take that, for example, why did, we didn't take this bill up two weeks ago or a week ago or this week. Um, the, the reason she wanted to, uh, to her credit, I think, um, hold off on uh, bringing this before the House is to see where this winds up in the, the budget process. I, I mean, I will tell you, uh, if there is not money for this in the budget, um, we, uh, you know, this work is not going to get done. Uh, so, so there's your opening, Mark. <laughs> um, Scott, I see your hand up. Yes, I just wanted to respond to Heidi's thoughtful comment uh, about um, the legislature ceding authority to, to, to the executive. Uh, and I, I'm I think that we put in here, uh, I think it was something like two pages of, of direction about what will be in the climate, what will be addressed by the, by the climate plan. And, uh, and we're, we're, we, we are uh, telling the Agency of Natural Resources to, well, the, the Climate Council to direct the Agency of Natural Resources to get this done. Um, and, we're doing that out, out of out of uh, in, in response to the urgency of the problem, and the the uh, the time that it takes to plan and implement uh, policies that are going to um, mitigate the, the effects of climate change and build resilience, especially in the rural areas, um, for what's coming down the track that that uh, Vermont can't stop. Uh, so that, that's, that, that's my feeling about, uh, about the direction and the, the, uh, the idea that we're ceding authority. Um, I, I guess I, I, I don't think, I don't know what, how more, how much more specific we could be than, than we have been, uh, in, in the, in the direction that we're giving, uh, the, uh, the Climate Council uh, to come up with policies, come up with direction for for A and R um, to implement the policies that we're that we're telling telling them we have to implement. So I, I guess I just wanted to to say that. I see two hands up. Uh, first Heidi, and then uh, Robin. So uh, thank you, Scott. And just in, in response, and I appreciate, I appreciate what you're saying. I truly do. And I know uh, that the chair and the committee has worked hard on this. Um, and I understand that. Um, I really just have two words, Act 46. That's it. Um, that's, that is my fear. Um, and it will inevitably happen. Um, and things will happen that we never voted on. And, uh, and we'll have to, we'll be, we'll be, um, uh, and, and I think the, a, a lot of us, just like a lot of people who supported Act 46, who voted for it, uh, regretted that decision afterwards. So as someone who voted against Act 46, I'm gonna call on uh, Robin. Uh, I did vote against Act 46. Um, and uh, I, I, I really appreciate the, you know, the thoughtful exchanges going on, on on all sides here and um <clears throat> and I, I guess i i feel like there are um a couple of safeguards built in although uh you know heidi's concerns about act 46 show that they're not foolproof safeguards but um 
One is that, that regardless of what rules are adopted, no longer promulgated, but adopted, um, any allocation has to come from, any financial allocation has to come from the legislature. So that's one check and balance on it. Um, and another is uh, the rules have to be consistent with legislative intent, which is the lens that Elkar views them through and not to put full, Elkar is a, another check and balance, not to put full responsibility on Elkar, but um, because any agency or uh, group of people can, can raise concerns about whether rules comply with legislative intent. So um, certainly I understand Heidi's concern, but, but there are a couple of checks and balances in place. Thanks, Robin. Um, Laura. Hey, Tim. Tim, oh, could we sorry? Could, could we could we have Luke uh, uh, remove the screen on of the bill? I yeah, I don't know as so we need to see that, and it'd be nice to yeah. see other members. Thank you. Sure. Yep. Uh, go ahead, Laura. Uh, so, as someone who did vote for Act Forty Six. Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I will say um, that. Uh, we can't, we're the legislature. So we could repeal Act 46. We could make major corrections to Act 46. Um, it's difficult to do. Dif uh, Act 46, you know, put together a really weird coalition, but we could make major changes to that. So I appreciate um, all of the points. Um, Mr. Chair, I'm going to go out on a limb. I, who is the, I can't remember who the person is with the quote that everything that has to, I, I'm, I feel like we're starting to circle. So I'm going to see if the committee is at this place or not, but um, I would like to make a move, uh, a motion to recommend that we concur with the changes that the Senate has proposed to uh, H688. I'll second that. Okay. Um, so we can certainly vote on that as a committee. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that the discussion has to end or, or questions um, can arise. Um, we've got a motion in a second. So, so, uh, so thank you for that. Um, but again, I don't want, let, sorry, I don't want to let that, I don't want to let that end. I'm sorry, go ahead, Heidi. Who was the second? Uh, Mike. Okay. Thank you. Um, again, I don't want to let that end discussion if, if um, there's more comments people want to make or questions people have for Luke. Um, so uh, I'm not seeing any other hands go up. So uh, Heidi, if you don't mind calling the roll, um, if you're able to do that now. And, and just to be clear for the committee, the vote here is on whether this committee recommends concurrence with the Senate proposals of amendment to H688. Okay, so Mr. Chairman, we're ready for a vote. Yep, go ahead and call the roll, Heidi. Um, Chestnut Tangerman. Yes. Campbell. Yes. Chase. Yes. Higley. No. Pat. Yes. Scheuermann, no. Sibelia. Yes. Yantachka. Yes. And Briglin. Yes. Um, you're, just you're, as a, it, Tim, you're it, the reporter, right? Yeah. So as an administrative matter, I, I don't know if there's any paperwork that needs to be done on that other than me using that whenever the bill gets called up, that, that vote count. I'll, um, I can, yeah, that's fine. It's, it's, uh, yeah, one, two, three, four. Yeah, you can use it. You can. Okay. Oh, yeah, because it doesn't have to go to the clerk, right? Th that's what call? I don't know. I oh, don't know the answer. I, I, think I, might have to. I can send it to her. Okay. When I reported S337, I was told by uh, Bill McGill to um, send an email to him and Rebecca Silberman, I guess, to that, yeah. that you are the reporter of the bill. 
Okay. And what's the point? Um, so uh, thank you, Luke, for joining us today. Really appreciate your help with this. Um, I am going to just quickly, before we adjourn today, um, turn the committee's attention to some of the budget things that we talked about <clears throat> earlier this week and made a recommendation to the House Appropriations Committee. Um, my understanding is that they are considering those today. Um, and the only change that I've heard about, and it's, it's actually not even a change, but um, the only thing that is, is different than I think the information that we were working with earlier this week is I believe that the Appropriations Committee is trying to um, put some money in the budget to support um, telecom planning. Uh, um, you all know that the recommendation that came from our committee on that, I think it was um, our lowest recommendation. Um, so uh, not exactly sure where that's coming from, but um, we'll see when the smoke comes out of the chimney of house appropriations um, when they're done with their work, which I, again, I think is today. So we'll see. Um, other than that, I don't have any new news for the committee. Um, Scott, did you have something you wanted to share? I just have a question about what committee meetings look like for next week. Do you have a thought about that? Yeah, I was just going to turn to that. Um, I do not. Um, if you Give me just a second. Uh, this morning, I actually it was yesterday, um, received an email from the speaker's office as to what next week's time slots are. So I beg your pardon, if you can just give me a second to pull this up. Um, I can tell you what those are. Let's see here. So, so the slots that we have been allocated were the same as this week. So I'm not telling you to put these on your calendar in pen, just in pencil. Um, but Tuesday from 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock, Thursday from 10.30 to 12.30, and Friday from 10.30 to 12.30. I can tell you that I'm pretty confident we're not gonna use all three of those. Um, one issue I know that, well, I won't say I know, I think is possible is gonna come back to us is um, with regard to some of the CUD funding that we have recommended. And again, this is, this is a truly unique budget year, I think, in that, um, you know, even as the budget, even as the budget goes through House Appropriations and is hopefully on the floor next week, um, I think conversations are going to continue, um, particularly about the CUD funding that we recommended, that three million dollars, one and a half for poll survey, one and a half for, um, you know, kind of equity funding to support veto loans. Uh, I think those two things are going to be hashed over quite a bit between the administration, between the Senate. Um, JFO, um, you know, there's questions about how confident are we that particularly the poll attachment funding or the poll um, survey funding is uh, reimbursable under CRF. So I don't have anything definitive to give the committee right now, just to say that oftentimes we will make a recommendation to the Appropriations Committee and then we're done and we don't see anything again until, you know, a few months later. I think that there is going to be some uh, some uh, work on particularly that question and funding issue uh, in the next week. So I am guessing right now that um, if we meet a couple of times next week, it is going to be on that issue. And my <clears throat> um, my instinct at this point, Scott, and this is a really long-winded way of answering your question, is that those hearings that we would hold would be on Thursday and Friday next week, not Tuesday. So if you want to um, put the Tuesday hearing time in the lightest erasable pencil on your calendar, I would say that's the wisest thing to do and that we will be more likely to meet on Thursday and Friday. So. Great. Appreciate it. Okay, on that note, Tim, um, 
other than the emails we get from Danielle, could we get uh, another way of giving us a heads up? Especially yes, sir. if the meeting yeah. gets scheduled on the same day it's supposed to occur. Something like a text message. Yeah, I, I think that is not too big of an ask. And you know, I will also say that, um, and I'm trying not to be defensive here, some of this stuff is going on real time. Some of these questions that come up and the ability to pull folks in to testify before our committee. Um, but uh, thank you for that, Mike. I will do my very best to give folks as much heads up as possible. So um, I don't have anything else for folks today. Um, I think we're on the floor this afternoon uh, at two. So absent any other comments, um, thanks for the discussion today. Appreciate it. All right. Take care. Good weekend, everyone. Bye-bye.